Again, welcome to today's Lynx Universal TA event, Boldly Improving, Boldly Improve Learning Conditions, Eliminate the Educator sh Shortage by Supporting Effective New Teaching Induction uh, and Ongoing Professional Learning. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to our moderator, Marcella Movit. You're muted, Marcella. Yes, I, I just realized that. Thanks so much. I was trying to get a couple things um, handled behind the scenes. Thanks so much, Long, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, today's webinar is part of our Raise the Bar, Lead the World uh, topic that we are focusing on for this whole year. Um, it's a, a federal initiative that we are supporting um, from the Department of Education that we're really excited to have uh, part, have a small part in all of that. And we welcome all of you um, and are very grateful that you're here with us today. So uh, although, again, we're part, we're working as part of that um, initiative, specifically this is part of our Universal Technical Assistance Webinar Series. Uh, we like to fondly call it our Lynx Universal TA Wednesday webinar series. Um, that's a lot of words, but uh, <laughs> um, it's a monthly webinar series that we look at different topics that we know are really important to you as members of the field. It's a series that is intended to help you in supporting your state and your teachers and your administrators in building um, your internal capacity at the state or through the state in these important areas. Um, and we are recording today's webinar as we do all of our webinars so that we can make it available to you on our Links YouTube channel. So we hope that you'll um, check it out. It does take a little bit for us to get those there, but they will be there soon. All right, before we jump in and we hear from our wonderful presenters who I'm really excited to hear from, just a little bit more from me. Um, I wanted to share with you some links resources that we have available that can support you to continue this work. Um, so first we have uh, some resources related to uh, their state resources or some from the federal initiatives and also from our resource collection. Um, those are all related to the Promoting Teacher Effectiveness and Adult Education Project. We have again, both um, the, that was part of federal initiative and we have some resources related to that in the resource collection. Uh, we also have an online course that I encourage you to check out called Introduction to Teacher Effectiveness and Induction. And then within our links community, we have um, two places that I recommend that you can go to continue the conversations that we just start today. Um, the first is our professional development group. Second is our teaching and learning. And then at the bottom of your screen, we have four QR codes there. Uh, the first, the one all the way on the left, will allow you to access our federal initiatives page. The one to the right of that will allow you to access our resource collection. Um, the one to the right of that will allow you to access our courses. And last but not least, we have there a QR code that will allow you to join a community group. So I hope you will check all of those out. Um, and now, uh, without further ado, um, I would like to introduce our presenters. I'm going to do a slightly shorter introduction than we normally would, um, just uh, for the sake of time. Uh, first, we have with us uh, Carla Cossi, who is a senior technical assistance consultant with uh, the American Institutes for Research. Um, we are also joined by the wonderful Mandy Rose, who is the Dean of Adult ESL. Uh, and CE um, from St. Charles uh, Community College within the Adult Education Program. Um, and also we have uh, Patty Boxdorfer, who is the Program Coordinator and H um, HSE uh, High School um, Equivalency Lead Teacher for St. Charles Community College in the Adult Education Program as well. Um, and I, I welcome our um, presenters to share more about themselves if, if they'd like as we go through the presentation. Um, but for now, I'm gonna set, hand it over to Carla to get us started. Thank you, Marcella, so much for that introduction. And I'm excited to be here today as well to kind of um, 
hit on an important topic and in terms of learner outcomes and how we need to actually focus on keeping our teachers in the classroom so that we can serve the students more effectively. Um, so that's what we're going to do. I wanna talk about our objectives. Um, as a result of this workshop, I wanna make sure that you walk away with an understanding of some national trends in teacher attrition, as well as the effect on learner outcomes. We're gonna recognize the importance of teacher retention on adult education program outcomes. And then finally, we're gonna actually explore um, teacher induction and mentoring as a promising practice to retaining our teachers. Now, before I go forward, I just wanna say that I love participation. Um, so, you know, I will ask you to go to the chat and chime in throughout this presentation. And I'm sure Mandy, as well as Pat, will do the same to see what you have to say. So what we're going to do, um, we're going to review some of these national trends in teacher attrition to gain understanding of how they influence our learner outcomes. So if you would make sure that you place any questions or any comments in the chat so that we can address those as we go. So these, these, this comes from research from both adult education as well as K-12. And a lot of this may not surprise you um, if you've been in the field for a while. Turnover is most frequent among part-time and full-time teachers, um, as well as full-time teachers tend to have more experience than part-time teachers. That's a given. And we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into some of these trends and how they affect outcomes. But also too, younger teachers and those early in their careers are most likely to leave. And then finally, you know, we're going to talk about the outlook on employment and the fact that teachers um, in adult education are projected to decline. To be totally honest, the Bureau of Labor Statistics says that employment in adult basic education, secondary education, and ESL uh, for ESL teachers is proje projected to decline by about 13% over the next 10 years, um, which means that there's going to be an average of about 4,200 openings for these teachers. Um, annually during this time frame. I, I, I don't know about you guys, but that that's that's a large. Thank you. Exactly. That's a large amount of people to actually be focusing on. So I want to ask a question um, because that stat for me was really, really an eye opening experience. So for you, tell me why are your teachers leaving? Um, I know that many of us have had transition um, and then I don't know if you actually use exit surveys for your staff where you can actually find out the whys, but I'd like to, if you could, if you're willing to share in the chat, tell us why your teachers are leaving. Um, and as we do that, I just want to explain that on the slide, you have the question, why are teachers leaving, as well as arrows coming from the school in all directions, showing salary, I love it, burnout, elderly parents. Ms. Patty, that was one of the reasons why I had to leave the state office, full-time work. So I'm looking at this, these are resonating most definitely. So I do want you to actually focus on some of those trends that you know is predominantly part-time work, that full-time teachers typically have longer tenures and that that's gonna actually be a very important point to, to note. And that younger and novice teachers leave more frequently as well as that employment outlook projects a decline. So let's keep that in mind. Excellent, let's see. Some teachers are nearing retirement. Exactly, some of our tenure teachers are some of, as my grandmother would say, some of our most seasoned teachers. So let's talk about it. All right, so the effect on students, before we actually dive into some of these um, facts, the effect on, on our students is, is real. So, Instability in the quality of education provided. Of course, we know that turnover widely um, is acknowledged by practitioners as a really significant problem in education overall, right? Because it negatively affects student outcomes as well as program budgets. I wanna make sure I add that little caveat too. So a shortage of teachers can threaten the stability of providing quality education and ultimately impacting student performance as well as discipline. Um, you have those educational inequities where, you know, um, teacher attrition can attribute to those inequities as students that are most in need are also most impacted by the turnover. Um, you also have that higher turnover rates for teachers who are already underrepresented. So that's either, you know, male teachers and, and the, there's that lack of diversity as well. Um, so 
you know, turnover rate for teachers who are already underrepresented in the workforce is particularly high. And that's concerning because, you know, there's a positive impact on diversity in the classroom for all students. And students of color and students that are, are learning English benefit from having teachers that look like them or speak their language and engage in asset-based teaching and then understand the connections to language development in deep and meaningful ways, right? So we know uh, through research that teacher attrition or retention usually supports student achievement and skill gain. So I'm a proponent of data and, and making data-driven dis decisions. Um, so I wanna make sure that we are actually utilizing that approach when we're trying to figure out the best way to approach the issue. Um, I'm going to the chat, I think. Oh, I love it. Migration, illness and out migration. Oh, Lu Lucia, can you come off mute and kind of add to that? and connect that to what we were just talking about, if you don't mind. Um, okay, so I'm from uh, Palau, mm -hmm. and uh, we're a small island, and I think uh, it's the economy and uh, our teachers, especially because um, the inflation and the uh, food expensive, so they, they migrate to the United States or to the other, like Asian country for a better, uh, especially we get the program in my island where we get a, they support you to get a degree in the university and then uh, you get a better job and then you want to relocate maybe to the United States or, oh, wow. or Hawaii. Yeah. And some, yeah. Mm -hmm. I love it. So, so access to opportunity, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I love it. Thank you for sharing. I'm going to go back a slide if I can, um, just so I can make sure that I, you know, make some points because I think I kind of miss some things here I wanted to necessarily say. Um, so just driving home, especially going back and looking at what you placed in the comments, because I want to address some of the compensation and some other things. Um, of course, like I said, the part time status, you know, with predominantly part time work. It, it generally restricts who can apply for these positions. Right. So that impacts diversity among adult education staff, which also, like I said, compounding with that lack of racial and gender diversity, um, as well as economic status. So, like, you know, giving a nod to what Lu Lucia was saying too. And then also too, tenure. I'm going back to that retirement. That's an excellent point. You know, the stat focused on younger teachers, um, but, you know, we know that they may not be adept, so to speak, to managing the many hats that, you know, adult education teachers have to wear. You know, they may go into training and certified in one particular subject, but when you come into our classrooms, you're what you're you, you know you do everything. Um, if you don't, you know, if you're not too, uh, if you're if you're not in a predominantly program that has much affluence, you may even be so much as security sometimes or, or a ride share, you know. At the end of the day, so that that's a culture shock, you know, when you think of those younger teachers coming into the classrooms. And then not only that, you know, we have. Our, our, our tenured teachers who, like you said in the comments, that experience, that burnout, um, because again, you know, our, our field is changing and these initiatives are constantly evolving. And so, you know, sometimes that can be a tad bit much, not, not to mention that, you know, as our student populations are rising and our teacher populations are falling, class sizes can be a bit overwhelming. So we need to make sure that we're focusing on some of those data points. I also, too, want to say that sometimes, you know, difficult working conditions has also been, you know, touted as a reason why our teachers are leaving the classrooms because they may lack um, administrative support or the administrator themselves may have an inability to maybe encourage or acknowledge staff. You know, not everyone is actually in, you know, a position for a paycheck. You know, recognition goes a long way as well, too. And sometimes, you know, the vision just isn't communicated clearly. Um, so, you know, business is not running as smoothly as, as it should be. And, and, and to talk about that low compensation, because you're absolutely right in regards to some of our teachers are leaving because, you know, you know, the family sustaining wages that we we are trying to get for our students may not necessarily be there for our teachers. Um, and just to give you a, a, another stat, like the median annual wage for ABE and, and secondary ed and ESL instructors 
was about $59,000 in 2021, but the lowest 10% earned less than $35,000 a year. So, I mean, I just really want you to kind of think about that as we talk further about the effects on, you know, the student outcomes, because we need to actually pour into the teachers that are teaching them. All right, so why does it matter? Um, I want you to tell me, again, go to the chat. Tell me what, why, why does it matter? Give me a few reasons why you think teacher retention matters to program outcomes. No one knows why it matters, why we're keeping our teachers in the class. But thank you. Relationships. I love it. I love the relationships piece. That's a good nod. Inconsistency in instruction. Historic. Pro yes. Uh, programmatic or pragmatic knowledge. So like the institutional right. knowledge, you're keeping it right. I, yes, I, I did it. mean programmatic. I, I figured it out. Look, and then you had some backup too, also too, by one of the participants. But yeah, that institutional knowledge, like we were talking about, full-time teachers stay longer. So that's an opportunity for you to keep the institutional knowledge as well as keep the consistency in your instruction in the field. Absolutely. So I'm going to go here and tell you consistency and continuity. You're absolutely right. That's an excellent, I'm going to start there because I like that point. Um, so teacher retention plays a crucial role in the effectiveness of adult education programs and directly impacts learner outcomes. And so when we retain our teachers at higher rates, programs can benefit from increased stability and continuity and in instruction, which then leads to improved learner experiences and outcomes for adult learners. Um, instruction, right? So Teacher retention contributes to consistency and continuity by allowing um, our educators to build rapport and with students, as well as to understand their unique needs and tailor instructional approaches accordingly, right? That, that goes back to that nod for the diversity in the classroom. So experienced and knowledgeable teachers are just better equipped to, to deliver high quality instruction. Right, so they can facilitate meaningful um, experience, learning experiences, as well as address diverse learning needs effectively, right? Teacher retention promotes professional expertise and instructional excellence, which leads then to improved learning outcomes and skill development among our adult learners. Student engagement and motivation was definitely on the list there too, right? So that, to that teacher-student relationship is a key driver to student engagement and motivation, right? So when teachers remain with the program for an extended period of time, they establish trust and create a supportive learning environment conducive to active participation and learning, kind of like what we're doing here, right? It also promotes a positive work environment, which is conducive to collaboration and innovation. You know, if, if you want to come to work and you enjoy the people you work with, you stay. Um, and then also, too, program stability, cohesion, and innovation. Higher teacher turnover can disrupt program stability, it's just, and as well as cohesion, right? Because I'm going to want to know why Pat left and, and then why Mandy left two weeks later. It's just the nature of who we, who we are as human beings, right? Which that then leads to administrative challenges and then staff morale issues and then increased workload for the remaining staff. See the domino effect? Um, so a stable teaching workforce contributes to program continuity. It enhances your organizational effectiveness and promotes a positive work environment, which is conducive to collaboration and innovation. So let's take a look at one of the strategies I would definitely say would be a really good tool to use. Like a Bear with me, I apologize you all. My internet is unstable. And so I'm getting really nervous every time I, I, I it toggles a bit. So teacher induction and mentorship, mentoring programs are generally one strategy that we can use to address teacher attrition, um, which again, like I said, can have a negative effect on student achievement. But, you know, the terms mentoring and induction are often used 
interchangeably. However, mentoring is one-on-one -on -one support and feedback provided by an experienced veteran teacher to a newer struggling um, teacher. Induction is a program that's a larger system of support, right? Um, it, it offers mentoring. Sometimes it also is included in, in that system of support, but it also includes like, you know, help with curriculum planning, professional development that can, you know, help beginning uh, instructors learn the teaching craft and become better instructors. And it also, you know, it also includes how they can effectively serve their students. Um, when you're pairing new teachers with experienced mentors, um, that helps to provide a crucial support during a transition period. You know, if you go back to that stat, teachers early on in their career are most pre most more prone to leave. So if you're pairing those teachers, that gives me someone to say that I have someone I can lean on. That's the one that I can go to because I may not want to ask my administrator, um, you know, for fear of maybe retaliation or just a negative effect. So that's a wonderful practice. And then those mentors offer guidance and share best, best practices and help new teachers navigate challenges. Um, and then, of course, they also provide that regular feedback. In, in any induction or mentoring program, there should be feedback, both between the mentor and the mentee, but also from the administration. Um, that regular feedback and assess, uh, assessment is essential to the effective induction program implementation, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but again, I, I said before, you know, a paycheck may not be my motivation, but that recognition, the fact that you heard me, you know, the fact that, hey, I can add my input. And I may feel now a part of the decision making. You know, that teacher voice was also one of those things that they said mattered in terms of retaining your, your, your teachers. So implementing support and mentoring programs for new and experienced teachers can help address challenges related to workload, classroom management, professional growth. Um, as well as monitoring participation rates and outcomes of these programs can provide insights to the effectiveness um, our programs and states effectiveness of retaining their instructors. So on the screen, it's an actual screenshot of a guide, a mentoring guide that was um, developed by AIR in partnership with Lynx. Um, so I just want to make sure it's an actually really a, a really good resource because it provides some um, excellent criteria for mentoring and gives you kind of a, a blueprint or a framework to kind of start there too. Um, some of the criteria that they mentioned is that interpersonal skills. You know, everyone that can is a good teacher of a student may not be a good mentor of a peer. So you definitely want to make sure that when you're pairing, you know, in, if you're implementing this strategy, that you're pairing individuals that actually, it, for, as, as my mother would say, that juge or fit well together, so to speak. Um, and then also, too, you want to make sure that instructional effectiveness is, is, is definitely at the you know, forefront of your criteria. Because you don't want a teacher that it's not meeting performance or exceeding performance to be, you know, that standout person to kind of keep that ball rolling. So you need to make sure that, you know, you have specific criteria for that. As well as leadership, you know, leadership needs to be involved at the onset, you know, definitely. And then also too, they need to be a part of the process. Make sure you're having regular check-ins and various things like that. And then of course, like I said, work experience. Oftentimes people benefit when they pair individuals that have maybe the same content area or the same backgrounds and various things like that just because that kind of adds to that interpersonal relationship. Um, but I just want to also say too, that it's important to note that as, you know, like I said, our classrooms are filling up and, you know, we got to have these high quality teachers in place to provide effective instruction. And we want to be certain that, you know, we have, we're implementing a strategy that allows us to do just that. Um, I want to talk about the importance of teacher diversity before I yield the floor to my colleagues here from Missouri. And again, bear with me as I try to navigate this screen. And I hope you can hear me because I lost my internet. Long, can you advance the slide for me? Because I don't know what's going on with my internet. Thank you so much. Um, I'm reminded of a quote uh, by Richard Riley, who was the former Secretary of Education, and it said that our teachers should look like America. 
right? You know, his words reflect a longstanding concern about the mismatch between the demographics of teacher, the teacher workforce and our nation's students. Um, so a significant body of literature argues that, you know, uh, the match between the race and ethnicity of teachers and students leads to better student outcomes, particularly in high quality poverty environments and, and specifically with at-risk student populations, right? So having that diverse teaching staff, including male teachers, allows for better representation of the diverse backgrounds and experiences of adult learners. You know, male teachers can serve as role models for male students, um, particularly those who may have, have limited exposure to male authority figures in educational settings before. You know, diversity in teaching staff brings different perspectives in teaching staff into the classrooms. And then adult learners come from diverse backgrounds and, and may have unique needs and preferences um, which it, which comes into teaching styles and methods of instruction. So having a diverse teaching staff allows for a better accommodation of these varied needs, ensuring that all learners have access to effective learning experiences. Um, the presence of male teachers in adult education, along with the diverse teaching staff overall, is crucial to creating inclusive learning environments, challenging stereotypes, and meeting the diverse needs of adult learners. And I think that policy matrix makers um, should prioritize diversity as even as challenges arise with the vacancies and the shortages, right? And so as we continue our efforts to retain our high quality teachers, let's be certain that we're recruiting underrepresented teachers as well. And with that, I am going to pass it off to, thank you Long, because I, I lost the ability to advance. I'm gonna pass it off to Mandy and, and, and Pat so they can tell you a little bit about what they're doing in terms of induction and mentoring. Thank you, Carla, very much. Um, I'm Mandy Rose and um, I'm in Missouri and I am the not only the director of the adult education program here, but the dean for our credit ESL program at St. Charles Community College and our community education program here at St. Charles Community College. Um, Missouri is the show me state, if you do not know that. So I wanted to give you some background information on our adult education program specifically, um, since that's our topic today. Um, because you may say, well, why are we listening to Missouri and what what have they got to offer? So our program um, in Missouri, we currently have 28 adult education programs. Um, those programs are funded on a three year grant cycle. Uh, our educators or our teachers um, in the state of Missouri are certified. So there is a certification process they go through, which includes a mandatory 20 hours of professional development a year. So keep that in mind. And I do know that not every state um, has that certification um, criteria. So we are operated under with certified teachers. Um, they can, certification means you have to have a bachelor's degree. Um, it does not have to be in education. So we do get a lot of teachers from other fields. Um, our program specific, we are a suburb of St. Louis to the West. Um, our program covers uh, St. Charles, Lincoln, Warren, and Pike counties. Very interesting um, service area as St. Charles County is a suburbia area and Pike, Lincoln, and Warren are very rural areas. So that's been, that's a, um, a great challenge. We have a lot of flavor um, and a lot of different things that we wouldn't normally have if we were just a suburban serving program. This year we have served more than a thousand students. Um, I have to tell you that's been a huge challenge because that's an increase of about almost 30% from last year. Um, most And all of those students, for the most part, ESL students, um, that's where we've seen the increase. We do get a state match, um, but we also get federal grant money. Um, we have a core adult education grant, and I also we also <coughs> have a IELCE grant to serve um, specifically ESL students. Um, our grant cycle is three years. I told you that. We have six office staff, um, five full-time and one part-time. Um, 
we have 37 instructors. They are all part-time. Um, so every instructor, and when Carla mentioned the low end of an instructor's salary was $35,000 a year, I would guess that our highest paid instructor probably only makes about $20,000 a year. So um, that in Missouri, uh, my starting wage, I can, I'll tell you my starting wage, um, our starting salary um, in my program, and this is pretty common in my area, um, is $17 an hour for no experience. Um, so, and these people, like I said, are all part-time, so they are hourly um, instructors. Um, I have a question, if I can stop and answer in the chat. Um, our certification is different, yes, from um, K-12 teacher licensing. Yes, it is. Um, adult Ed is a specific certification workshop. Um, there are two actual workshops to become certified in the state of Missouri for adult education. Um, it's a certification like a sub-cert or a career tech cert. And then um, there's a period of four years where teachers or have an initial certification, and then after that time, they can upgrade their certification. So it is different than K-12 certification. Um, such good questions. Um, Sarah, back in the day, and when I say back in the day, I'm talking pre-COVID, um, mostly our teachers are only teaching for us part-time. We do have a small portion, and I should have looked at those statistics when I um, gathered some data. Um, we do have a small portion that have full-time jobs um, and teach for us. Um, and back in the day, it would have been that most of them were just teaching for us and did not have um, full-time jobs. But I will tell you this, a lot of, a lot of, um, places I go and I start talking about adult education because there's not a general society understanding of what we do. And so I talk about it a lot everywhere I go. And people always say, oh, well, you've got all those K-12 teachers. And I say, well, no, I don't. And sometimes um, K-12 teachers don't fit into adult ed, depending on um, how they taught in K-12. So we do not, we only have, I think at this point, three retired K-12 teachers um, in my 37 teacher staff. So um, just to let you know, most of them are not K-12 teachers. Um, here's some demographic data. 14% are male, 14% um, are of a race other than Caucasian. Um, we do have quite a few, what I consider quite a few for our area that are bilingual. Um, the, the male teachers, um, I've been trying to do that. Um, interestingly enough, we've probably had more males apply for jobs in the last five years than ever before. Um, I do believe that there's, there's, they contribute greatly um, to the classroom. So um, I'm always trying to seek a diverse, a diverse group of instructors. I talk to people a lot of times, you know, I don't just use our ads. I talk to people who know people or I have a great teacher and she says, I've got a friend. I mean, this is what we do, right? When you're an adult ed. 68% um, of our teachers have been here for more than five years. Um, that statistic prior to COVID was much higher. I will tell you that. 41% have stayed 10 plus years. That shocked me when I when I read that, because that used to be extremely high. I used to be able to say 80% um, of our teachers had been here for more than 10 years um, prior to COVID. 20% um, leave within the first three years. This is following right along the track that Carla just um, revealed in some of her data. 1% leave after the first year. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we are. This was, I just did this data recently too, so... Um, this is pretty up to date for us. Um, Andy, you have a few questions. I do. I see. Can you share your certification process? I'm not exactly sure. Amy, do you mean with you um, later or do you mean right now? <laughs> do you want me to talk about it right now? Um, maybe that's something that we can uh, send you directly, Amy. Um, yeah. I can coordinate that. Yeah, let me aim. I will be, I will share, Patty and I will share our emails at the end too. 
So anything that I've said that you want, you know, we are the show me state. So we're used to people saying, well, you better show me. Um, so anything that we've got that you want or you want to discuss further, we would be more than happy um, to do that. Um, the benefits, Cliff, I will tell you that that's um, a, a great, a very great, which I think is part, part of, Maddie, the whole conversation about who leaves adult ed, part-time people leave, you know, that is one of the challenges for teacher retention. Um, so it absolutely benefits in this day and age. Um, it, it's an issue. It's an issue. I have, I, do, I can tell you because I'm at a, my program is based in a community college. Not every adult ed program in Missouri is based in a community college. Um, I know that in Alabama, I think they're all in community colleges. In Missouri, we are not. And I do know that I get applications for positions when I post them that are people who think they're applying to work at the community college. So I know, and I know that's because of benefits. I mean, I when I talk to people on the phone or whatever, I, I can tell um, from just screening applicants that that is a huge concern. Um and yes, Amy, I can email some things to you for sure. Um, so these are, this is kind of where we are right now with our staff. Um, I will tell you our teachers, we have classes I can give you. Do I talk about that? I might have that. No. Um, we have classes Monday through Saturday morning from 9 a.m. to noon. And then Monday through Thursday night from 6 to 9 p.m on the main campus and we do have classes off the campus. So we have a pretty intense schedule. Um, I think I talked later, we teach about 80 classes a week. Um, so we do have part-time people that um, piece together schedules. Like some of them will teach on Tuesday and Wednesday night or someone might teach on Monday and Thursday. So um, some have clustered classes that they are there um, every Monday, Wednesday, some of them switch up. So that's kind of the nature of, of what we do here. But we are relatively a big program in Missouri. Um, probably the St. Louis program and the Kansas City program um, are pretty much the only two programs that are much bigger than we are. We tend to be in the top five in size in Missouri. Why do I think our teachers stay? Um, there are five reasons I really think our teachers stay. Um, the longevity of the office staff, um, which um, I'll show you next slide. We'll get into these, but I'll run through these briefly. Um, in our intentional shadowing program, we're going to talk about that. Best thing we ever did. I'm, hands down, if you remember nothing else that Missouri ever has to say, shadowing. Just remember shadowing. Um, our intentional onboarding program. Um, our mentoring program and our follow-up to both onboarding and mentoring. These are the things that I that I think um, contribute to our teachers staying um, in our program. Not that we don't lose some, but I think these are the ones, these are the five main things that contribute to people staying. Um, here is a picture of two of our teachers waiting in line to be seated at our graduation ceremony um, that we have every summer. Um, and I just thought it was, a, they're happy people, most of our teachers. Um, our staff demographics, we have six program office staff. Five, like I said, are full-time. One is part-time. Everyone but the part-time person has been with the program for more than 15 years. And when I say more than 15 years, it's 17 and up. So um, that, I believe, is a huge reason why um, our part-time instructors stay um, our part-time staff person, I think, has been here now four years. Um, an office of people that are familiar with the program, they know what needs to happen, when it needs to happen. Um, they anticipate the needs of instructors before the instructors even ask. I mean, we it's a fine-tuned machine, right? Um, they are, we have a, a great diverse blend of, thinking styles, um, behaviors, abilities. Uh, but I do believe that one of the main reasons our staff um, stay are office staff. Uh, we support, we do have two. Patty is a lead teacher for high school equivalency classes and I have a lead teacher for 
our English as a second language program. Um, so there's a lot of support for instructors in many, many different ways, many ways. Um, intentional shadowing. Um, when I talk about the things that we actually do um, or did or are doing to keep people, um, I want to say too, I think everything has to be intentional. Um, I can, I will talk a little bit at the end if we have time about what, what has happened with um, hiring and, and staff for us this last year because of our influx of students. But I think the more you can plan and the more you can be intentionally doing some of these activities, the better off you are. Um, we actually came upon shadowing. I was at a director's conference um, and one of the directors in a program north of us was talking about, um, we were talking about teacher retention and she said, oh, you know, I've had these teachers shadowing. And I said, what do you mean shadowing? And so she explained it to me. So um, shadowing is basically teachers coming and observing a class that is a like class, right? A class that fits that whole profile of what they're going to be teaching. Um, and what, uh, you know, fits in with what level are you teaching? Or are you teaching high school equivalency? Are you teaching beginner ESL? Um, that fits that mode. And they shadow in that class three to four times, two to three weeks, um, two months, um, whatever, until their comfort level is such that they can say, oh, I've got it, right? So they shadow with a teacher, an experienced teacher. Um, this has been such a simple thing to do. Um, and I know that everyone will be concerned about money and I, I can certainly talk to that, but this is such a simple thing to do and it has been such a wonderful thing. So what does shadowing do? What does that do for your new instructor? So that it, it helps the instructor experience the culture of the organization and the classroom before they start teaching. Um, when, we interview, when we interview prospective teachers here, and I didn't really talk a lot about the interviewing process, but we, if I, if I'm interested in a teacher and I, and I try to interview the teachers as much as I can, because I think it's important for them to meet me right from the get go. I do a lot of the phone calling, um, to set up interviews. I do a lot of that. And I think that's a very important thing to be done. But when we interview them, if we, I can always tell if the people on the team are interested in that teacher because we immediately invite them to observe a class. Um, so that that's very, because sometimes people are interviewing with you that have never seen an adult ed classroom before. Um, and I can tell you that there's a lot of confusion. A lot of K-12 teachers don't understand that I don't have one textbook that we teach from. So it's so much, so much of an eye opener for them to, to sit and observe a class. So intentional shadowing just takes that one step further. I've already hired that teacher. Um, that teacher's with us. We've welcomed that teacher and we've said, you know what, before you start teaching, let's have you shadow in a class. Um, it gives them an experience of what we, the culture of our organization, which you have to experience to understand the classroom, it helps them meet other staff and begin to form relationships with other staff before they actually are by themselves in a classroom. Um, they can see examples of experienced teaching, um, which is very important, especially if they're new to the field of adult education, um, which according to, to Carla, if we're going to have 42,000 jobs in the, in the next uh, five years, then there are going to be a lot of people new to the field of adult education. Um, they can become familiar with organizational surroundings and routines. Um, when does that class go on break? Uh, where are the where are the dry erase markers? Where are the Kleenex? All of those things. They can ask questions of the teachers that they shadow. Um, they can observe the different methods of teaching um, that our experienced teachers have and, and utilize. Um, and they can meet the students, which is perhaps one of the most important things. Um, because they that that is why, honestly, I think um, if you stay in adult education, the students are what keeps you here. Um, so these are all very, very wonderful things that we have seen come from shadowing. And it has been a, a great 
um, experience. Now, sometimes you can't do this. So I, I'm not going to be, I'm not a Pollyanna. And I know that sometimes you're hiring a teacher over the summer and let's say the class is on a break. Um, but if you intentionally plan this, you can make it so that for the most part, your newer teachers have the, have the chance to do intentional shadowing um, with an experienced teacher in a classroom that's similar to where they will teach. Um, we have an intentional onboarding. Um, I believe this is Patty's slide. Patty. Yes. You're next. Sorry, okay. I tried to I tried to take your slide. We can never shut her up, okay? I did, yeah, I was gonna say the, the time frame. I'm gonna be quiet now though. I want to tell you that the picture that you saw of me before is part of my bucket list. That was actually goat yoga. So if it looked like I was on my belly laughing, there was a goat on my back and uh I was having a great time. So uh, intentional onboarding. Of course, everybody has some sort of onboarding, whether you call it that or not. You have to tell your teachers a little of this and a little of that before you start them. But I actually have a checklist that I use to make sure that I tell the teachers everything that I want them to know when they're starting their onboarding. Um, and then I'm going to come back around and talk a little bit about um, coming back around to that onboarding. But a new teacher, here's what happens. When we get a new teacher, we start them with a three-hour training with a lead teacher of either English uh, or ESL or our HSC lead teacher. So that's three hours that you're pouring into that new teacher. And usually they um, their brain explodes and they can't possibly remember all of that. And over the years, Ingrid and I, uh, she's the lead teacher for our ESL, we've decided that three hours is important. However, we need to come back around and touch base with some of those things we taught them in the first three hours. And I'll get to that in a moment. And then we schedule a three hour tech training uh, to just learn the technology of the classroom. Um, we have a data system that all of our teachers are able to get into, and it's important that they do go to that data system to learn about their students and so on. And it's a little bit complicated. So it does take three hours to teach them about the tech in the classroom and then also our data system. And then they come in for a one hour training with me um, and I go over program wide stuff. Now, in their first three hours, they're going over teacher stuff, like what they need to know to be able to teach uh, English as a second language or high school equivalency. But my one hour is uh, all about program-wide information, their certification. I talk about payroll. And then that's when I also talk about uh, the mentoring program. And then before they ever step foot in a class, they have a two hour, one to two hour meeting with uh, their mentor. So I assign a mentor and I'll talk about that in just a minute. And I'd like to say here that you see already that there are four or five people that the new teacher has interacted with. And it just um, dawned on me that I would call these maybe touch points so that they're meeting many different people in the program. And we're a very friendly bunch around here, but that gives them the sense that, wow, I'm part of something that's a lot bigger than just me teaching one class. And then Ingrid and I discovered a few years back um, that one month in, we have a two hour additional training with the lead teacher because they have now forgotten some of the stuff that we told them in the three hour training when they first got here. First of all, they were nervous. It's a new job. They haven't been in the classroom yet, so on and so forth. So we've decided that that two hour additional meeting is super important and so well worth the money. Um, as is um, the shadowing. If there was ever something that's well worth the money, it's having them in the classroom, even if it's for one or two days or nights, uh, sitting with a teacher that's seasoned is well worth the money. And then we come back within the first couple of months. And if a teacher still needs a little bit of attention and help, we can put in another two hour optional training with the lead teacher um, about two months in. And the reason I say this two months in is if you're familiar with high school equivalency, uh, we have to take a pretest and give the students a post test. It's um, something required by our state. And so when I'm training a new teacher, I don't even talk to them about post testing because it's a whole monster in and of itself. And so I need at least a couple of hours to train them on how to post test their students because some of our funding uh, requires that. Some of our funding is dependent upon how many um, students progress to the next educational level. 
And then I can call them in optionally for another training. For instance, um, we had, I trained a new teacher uh, and we talked about payroll and I showed them the timesheet and how they fill it out and so on and so forth. And about four months later, we were in a um, all staff meeting and Mandy said something about, please put your, um, your class code on your uh, payroll on your timesheet. And the teacher said, I don't, I've never heard that before. I don't know what you're talking about. And it was like a light bulb came on because I checked it off my list. So I know that I, I went over that information with that new teacher, but it's just too much information coming at them too fast. So then I can schedule another hour long meeting and go over some of those things that maybe now they have questions about because they, they didn't even know what to ask in the first three meetings. And so then new teachers are introduced and recognized at all of our staff meetings. And so we put, uh, we walk the teachers around, we introduce them to everybody that's um, anywhere that can be introduced to so that they really do get a sense that they're part of something bigger and something very exciting. And um, let me go to the next slide then. Let's talk a little bit. Does anybody have any questions about that, um, about the onboarding? Let's see. Oh, somebody said, uh, Elizabeth said, such a robust onboarding process. Yes. Yes, it is. And we've learned over the years that um, we just have to do this and go come back around and have those extra meetings to make sure that our teachers are learning what they need uh, to learn and know uh, as they're getting in the classroom. Now, our mentoring program has been around for a long time, and we inherited a mentoring handbook from I don't know who. Um, I've been with the with the program 21 years, so I've, as long as I've known, it's been around. Um, now, our state of Missouri uh, Department of Ed has just, our adult ed, has just put out a new mentoring handbook. So probably this summer, I'll update ours just a little bit. But part of our mentoring program, before a teacher begins teaching, they are assigned a mentor for two years. That is a requirement by the state of Missouri. Then they get an official letter from me to the mentor and to the mentee introducing the teacher and the mentee. Um, and they get a handbook from us. And I go through the handbook in that first one hour meeting that is program related, related. And I show them the handbook and I show them the forms at the back of the handbook that they will be filling out throughout the next two years. And then the mentors are required to contact the mentees before their first class, before they teach their first class. And then they set up a day and a time to meet. And we do like our mentors and mentees to meet before the class begins. Oh, yes, we are going to share our mentoring handbook. We'll send that out to anyone that um, would like it. Um, Patty, I can answer the questions in the chat for you while oh, thank you. That'd be great. Board. Okay. I don't want to distract you. Okay. Yeah, you see me looking over here. Okay, so um, so that mentor then meets with that mentee uh, for the first time, one to two hours. Now, we used to have three hours of paid mentor-mentee time um, for our mentors and our mentees, and they would meet in the fall and then in the late winter and then the early spring. But I really feel like what has happened, and it's just been pretty natural, they meet and they can't stop talking about the program. And so it runs into two hours and then they'll freak out thinking, oh my goodness, we, we ran over. So we tell our mentors and our mentees, go ahead, if you need two hours, go ahead and meet for that two hours. And then you'll come back and then you'll meet again um, throughout the fall and the winter and the spring. And then the next bullet point is mentors observe mentees for three hours in the first month, followed by a one hour meeting to answer questions and share strategies. So it is required that our mentors go into the mentees classroom and just observe from the back. And then usually after that, they have a one hour meeting. If it's an evening class, they usually put off that one hour meeting uh, within the first few days after that. And then they just talk about strategies and they talk about um, the, what happened and you know their fears, their worries, their concerns and so on. I will tell you that um, Mandy from the top um, is a very uh, positive um, director and uh, some we've had a feeling that some directors get a little bit punitive sometimes and we never go about our mentors, our mentees, our, our teachers, we're never punitive with them because we find that 
that just drags everyone down. And so our mentors know that they're not there to be punitive to the teacher that they're watching. They're there just to uphold that um, teacher and to lift up that teacher and to help them in any way they can. And that's how we are around here, all of us from the top down. Then the mentee, after um, the mentor goes into the class, then the mentee observes the mentor's class for three hours during the first month or sometimes it even happens during their shadowing time. And then they meet for one hour following that observation. And so during the shadowing time, a lot of times the mentee and the mentor are, have already hooked up. And then sometimes it's that teacher that their, their mentee or their mentor is that teacher. And so if we can get them in the class for three times, two times, five times, whatever the case may be, as much as we can afford to do that, then that just helps that mentee uh, before they start their first class. And then the mentor and the mentee are required to meet in the fall, the winter, and early spring for their first year of mentoring. And then the mentor uh, mentors sit with the mentees at our staff meetings, our teacher meetings, so that that new teacher doesn't have to walk into a huge staff meeting all by themselves. They see a friendly face right away. And so we make sure to set that mentor with that mentee because there are going to be all kinds of things that are being talked about that the mentee has never heard of. And so then they can whisper to their mentor and uh, a lot of learning goes on during those staff meetings. And then the second year uh, mentors will still meet with their mentees, but they just meet a little less often, but still three times a year or however long it takes. Now, I will tell you, um, and Carla kind of mentioned that uh, the dynamic of the mentor and the mentee um, are, it, that dynamic is really important. We did have a wonderful mentor that was um, scheduled with one of our teachers and they didn't click. One was a real type A person and the other one was a very laid back kind of person. And so we knew about three or four months in that wasn't working. And rather than beat ourselves over the head, um, and try to make that relationship better, uh, we just said, you know what, we're just going to let you off the hook um, as a mentor, and we're going to bring somebody else in. And that uh, being able to turn on a dime, I feel is important, um, rather than just, you know, grueling through two years of a mentor or a mentee that, that um, doesn't click is not a good idea. I'll tell you, too, uh, one other thing that we didn't put in here, but I was thinking about it, and we should have put in here. We had a trauma-informed um, PD last summer. Uh, it was put on by the state of Missouri, uh, by Dusty in the state of Missouri. And we can only have it two hours at a time because it is trauma-informed and it's very traumatic, of course. And so all of our teachers attended. Some of them thought it was actually a little too traumatic. But one of our teachers that always, um, I'll say, I'm not trying to um, throw shade on her, but she's always right about everything. And so she uh, let me know a little bit later on that that was so traumatic that it triggered her. And she said during that meeting, that two-hour trauma-informed meeting, she said, I think it would be good if our lead teacher would come in and just say hi and just talk to us for five minutes. And it like stabbed me in the heart because I'm in the classrooms a lot. But being in a classroom and having a touch point with your teacher is way two different things. Being in the classroom is, hey, you're talking to your students and so on and so forth, but actually touching base with a teacher where no one else is around um, has really taught me a lesson. And so I, I really have, in this last year and a half, I've really tried to make sure that I do go and touch base with each of the teachers. It's not easy, but it's purposeful. It's intentional um, because when she said that and knowing that she was um, triggered by our trauma informed, I'm thinking, wow. Our teachers are just as trauma and trauma traumatized sometimes as our students. Uh, we don't often know what's going on in their lives. I stopped uh, one teacher in the hall just yesterday, I believe it was, and she just looked down like she looked like somebody had beat her dog or something. And I said, oh, my goodness, what's going on? And she walked into another room and the door shut behind us and she just fell apart. I just learned that her brother had died. And so that touch point. It was super, super important to her, and it was important to me because I, I now know something that um, she needs more support, and our office staff got together to support her in many ways, and so on and so forth. So each of these mentoring times, each of these um, 
shadowing times, each of these big meetings that we plan for three hours, those are all touch points for our teachers. And by the time they get to their first class, we really feel like, yes, I like this place. I like these people. They really care about me. Mandy, do you want to get the... Oh, this is mine too. All right, so the follow-up and the onboarding and mentoring. The program has built in multiple intentional opportunities for follow-up of onboarding and training and mentoring. So we have added, we've been very intentional about training and mentoring meetings before a new teacher begins, as well as additional meetings um, after between two and six months. That's when a teacher's liable to go out screaming um, if it's gonna be too much. We do have the dean, which is Mandy, and myself, I'm the lead teacher, R. Ingrid. We observe new teachers within their first month. Again, when I set that appointment up, I tell my new teacher, we're not coming in to find out what you're doing wrong. We're coming in to help you uh, so that you can be a better, stronger teacher. And so I always make sure that they know that this is very casual and we're just here to help you. And then the new teachers meet with our dean, which is Mandy, and their lead teacher after 90 days. And again, this is a meeting where we say, what can we do to help? What, what things do you need in your classroom that you don't have? Uh, what would work better for you? Is there anything that is really going well with you? And is there anything that you're struggling with? And then new teachers are given a staff roster of all of our teachers and all of our staff in the program, and we really encourage those new teachers to contact any single person on that staff roster, uh, teacher roster, and any person will help them. All they have to do is me, uh, email, and then they will get help from any teacher. And then the new teachers are encouraged, and actually I encourage this for our old teachers as well, our seasoned teachers, not our old teachers. Uh, we encourage them to observe other teachers twice per year. We put that in our, um, in our grant so that they can get new ideas and new te teaching strategies from other teachers. So we really, really encourage our teachers to go watch registration or to go into another level of uh, maybe a beginning level if you're an advanced teacher or vice versa. Um, so that really um, helps our teachers uh, kind of stay together and they all know each other and they're all helping each other. And I do think that that has a lot to do with why they stay so long. And of course, Patty, can I add something, Patty, to that? Absolutely. Go for um, it. That we didn't that we didn't put on the slide. When I observe um, teachers within their first month of being here, I always, always, always. And sometimes I just don't have the time, but I make myself take the time to email back to that teacher. Thank them for letting me come to their class. Um, sometimes I apologize for participating too much because I do get pulled in and start enjoying things. Um, and also telling them all of the things they did right. Um, all of the things that I liked, all of the things that are applicable to the standards in adult ed that they did. I just try to really, um, beef them up. There are teachers sometimes that do things that maybe weren't the perfect example, um, I never bring those up. I might bring those up to a lead teacher and say, hey, you know, you might want to mention, you know, this. Um, my The example that comes to my head is an ESL teacher. Um, we require that they cover all the four skills of ESL learning, right, or learn English language learning. Um, and maybe the teacher's not having the students repeat, um, which is a very important thing, especially in the beginning um, classes. And so I might say, oh, you know, you know, I would never, though, say to a teacher, you need to have the students repeat after you. Um, I would always just praise, but just to let them know I was there, I was paying attention. Um, I see you. Really, that's just a way to say, I see you. Um, welcome. And we try to, I, I try to be very, I ask, I actually schedule with them and they tell me when I can come. I try not to be um, demanding, even though I'm going to, I'm going to observe them now, but I, um, you know, I do try to make it as, uh, as non-intrusive as possible. I just wanted to, and then the, the, the 90 day meeting is always very informal, um, mostly to find out what's working, what's not working. That might be a time that I might bring up something that I saw that felt like a snag to them or that I've seen, um, that is a snag for them. I might ask them about it at the 90 day meeting, but everything is very um, uh, non-accusatory and supportive. We try to be really supportive with, with our new folks, for sure. Mandy, the next slide is yours. 
Oh, look, I get to talk some more. Um, so the funding, and I, Maureen already had a question um, about funding. So um, I will tell you in Missouri, we have targets. We, we're grant funded, which I think most states do have some sort of grant that uh, we write for every three years. But in Missouri, the um, the performance equation is that if we don't meet uh, measurable skills gain targets um, and some other performance targets, we um, lose 10 percent of our funding. So let's say I got one hundred dollars. I wrote for a grant for one hundred dollars. And at the first year, they said, OK, Mandy, we're going to give you one hundred dollars. So they gave me that my one hundred dollars the first year. At the end of that year, I didn't meet targets. The next year they take um, $10 of my $100 away and I only have $90. So that's sort of how Missouri works. Um, I can tell you that we meet um, our measurable skill gains target in Missouri is 62%. Um, our average for the last three years is between 75 and 80% of our students um, progress at an educational level. And NRS, I don't want to derail ourselves and have an NRS conversation, but um, we do have a very successful um, program. Sorry, I forgot to start my video. Um, thank you, Long. Um, and so we do um, we do meet our targets for the state of Missouri each year. Um, about we have always. I came to this program in two thousand and seven. At that point, we had a mentoring handbook. We've done a lot of adjusting and um, renovation of our mentoring handbook. Um, but we did a mentoring handbook at that time. The director at that time, I was not the director of the program, did not pay. Um, about 10 years ago, we wrote into our grant to pay um, teachers for mentoring. And I basically uh, assume that I'm going to have five to six teachers I hire a year. That's not always true. But I assume that and I um lay out the cost for that in the grant and request that that uh, money for the mentoring in the grant. I also have to request money for their professional development because every teacher needs 20 hours of professional development a year um, to maintain their um, AEL certification. So we also do that. Um, so yeah, five to six teachers. The shadowing money comes um, from this. Typically, I don't hire six teachers a year. Um, so often I will dedicate some of that um, money for shadowing. I mean, literally shadowing for 12 hours of class time is only about $250 a teacher. Um, it may sound like, oh, where am I going to get the money? But um, I will, you know, forego some uh, red dry erase markers and I will pay sh for shadowing. So um, that's what we do. And so. I really think the funding, I know a lot of people worry about the funding. You do have to plan to have the funding um, to do mentoring. Like Patty said, um, mentoring, though, when I came, um, mentoring is mandatory in the state of Missouri, but there is no mentoring process that is mandatory. Um, if you work in adult ed, you'll understand that oxymoron. But um so although we need to mentor teachers for two new teachers for two years, just like new directors um, get mentored for two years, there is no process um, that there's no process that the state says you need to use this mentoring process. So we've kind of developed our own. A lot of this is stuff that we've just developed from making massive mistakes. Um, I've put I've got one teacher that I can think of who is a phenomenal adult education teacher and she is not a phenomenal mentor um and it's a shame because she has so much historical knowledge but she is not a good mentor um so it's kind of we've learned a lot of things uh by making mistakes um you know i always think this is like my mantra uh my angelo said people will not remember what you say they will not remember what you did they will remember how you make them feel and that is exactly what we try to do in that first year, because um, honestly, the new teachers are the ones that fly the quickest. Um, if we don't connect them um, to adult education, into the program, into our mission, into our students soon enough, um, they will they will go. I mean, nobody's coming here for the pay in Missouri. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Um, oh, whoops. Any questions? 
Any questions about the money? I know we had a lot of great questions um, throughout the session, but we'll let, we can pause for just a minute to see if anyone has questions about um, the funding or any of the other things that Mandy and Patty shared. Um, if not, uh, we'll um, post Mandy and Patty's email addresses in the chat so you can feel free to reach out to them. And um, I know there are lots of requests for uh, different pieces of, of things that you're doing. So uh, I appreciate that, uh, Mandy and Patty, for, that you're making yourselves available. Um, so if there are no other questions for them, right now, or if you want to continue to think about those questions. I wanted to share with you a little bit about next month's webinar and our webinar series um, related to Raise the Bar, Lead the World. We'll be looking next month at Create Pathways for Global Engagement Work-Based Learning, and that'll be on May 29th, 2024. Um, again, just like today, it will run from 3 to about 4.30 p.m. Eastern, which is noon to 12.30, uh, to 1.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. Um, Long has shared the link in the chat so that you can go ahead and register now. And we want to uh, make sure that we're meeting your needs as always. That's the whole point of having these webinars. So if there are any questions that you might have that you want to make sure that our uh, presenters uh, touch on during that session, please share those in the chat as well. Um, so before we go, uh, again, please do register for next month's webinar so that you can join us. Um, I also wanted to make sure on your radar was uh, another TA opportunity that we have coming up. Um, if you're interested in joining um, an informational session. No commitment at this point yet. Uh, we are providing technical assistance around the Adult Numeracy Instruction 2.0 or on uh, Adult Numeracy Instruction 2.0. Um, there's a QR code on your screen that you can scan um, to register for that webinar. It'll be on May 1st from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern. And if you have any questions about that, you can email us at training at links.ed.gov. We also are going to have a multi-state cohort um, related to the standards and action 2.0 uh, resources and training developed through that project. There's on your screen a QR code that you can use to register for that informational session that will be held on May 2nd from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern um, and long put the link in the chat as well. And for that one as well, if you have any questions, please feel free to email us at training at links.ed.gov. If there are no other questions about any of the wonderful information shared today, I want to go ahead and thank our wonderful presenters, Carla, Mandy, and Patty. I learned so much. I am just fascinated by the processes that you're using, Mandy and uh, Patty. It seems like uh, trial and error has really landed you in a place with a fantastic process. And Carla, thanks so much for sharing all that um, big picture information. It's always really important to be reminded of what the trends are at the national level to give us a better understanding of what and why we do what we do at the um, local level. With that, thanks so much, everyone. And uh, we hope that you can join us next month. Bye.